The PAX Gaming Convention is here and Freedom Games is attending. It is live right now, July 15th to the 18th, 2021. And as you can see in the schedule, Freedom Games is an exhibitor just like we were at E3. What's this, Freedom Family? Sansevora. This is a Souls-like action RPG game. It may remind you of Diablo, it's a dungeon crawler. And this is one that I'm personally super excited to play. Sansevora, wishlist now on Steam. The links are down there in the description below. Outerverse! Create and launch your own spaceship. Does this remind you of another kind of game? Version of Minecraft, guys. It's pretty cool. Ah, here we go. Skyfleet! Build your city in the sky. Defend against invaders. And collect resources. This should be a fun game. We announced some new games that we are publishing, like. Nine Years of Shadows. Let me show you some gameplay. There are 20 games that we have signed so far, Freedom Family, and I want to give you a taste of all of them by playing the full one-hour presentation that we live-streamed on PAX East. It was actually live-streamed twice, and I, in case you missed it, you can watch it right now. And again, click all the links down there in the description below to check out our games, wishlist them, and eventually buy them when they launch. Roll it! I decided, you know what, I've dabbled in indie games. I'm gonna give this one last shot. Let's just make a game. It felt like jumping to the deep end. I realized that making games is like a real thing that you can do. <laughs> it's just so, that's the word is liberating. We owned this project. We just want to make a fun game. You have an idea of what the vision of it looks like, but then it actually coming out the other side looking like that, it's pretty rare. Afterburn Studios is composed of primarily just three of us. I co-founded the studio with uh, two of my friends, Robert Taylor and Paul Svoboda. We had uh, all worked at a company that did not end up turning out like you know any of us had hoped. So coming out of that experience, the three of us felt uh, kind of burned out with game development. You know, we had worked at AAA studios beforehand and we wanted to do something that felt a little bit more authentic to who we were and what we liked and something that we could collaborate together to keep that working relationship going. I am more primarily a designer. Paul is more primarily an artist and Rob is primarily an engineer. Having the, the kind of the core pillars of, of game design already there and having experience allowed us to work a lot more quickly and collaborate a lot more easily. And it's, it's really exciting to be able to see a process from start to finish, which is one of those things you don't get to do a lot in AAA. Dreamscaper is an action roguelite where players take on the role of Cassidy and they get to live her life. There's a strong focus on the waking, dreaming gameplay cycle. So at night, you dungeon crawl through Cassidy's dreams. You find her memories. And they help empower her in order to take on the nightmares that she faces. And then during the day, you kind of explore this city that she has just moved to, uh, meet new people, upgrade relationships, trying to figure out her place in the world. And in doing so, that makes her more capable of developing the tools to take on these dreams. This game is really kind of a melting pot of all the influences we have had that we haven't expressed yet making other games. This is really the first time we've been able to pour so much of ourselves into the development of a game. And because of that, there's influences from all over. So there is kind of the dungeon layout and setup, there's a melee combat system, and then you have a mixture of high fantasy uh, elements grounded in reality because these are in someone's dreams, so it's pulling from the real world. So we're kind of picking and choosing and bringing stuff together that's an amalgam of what the three of us are interested in and what we really click with. 
and this beautiful music by uh, Dale North of Plus Paul's Art kind of bring it to this diametrically opposed place, but that works. Relaxing action roguelike. That was something that, that we really wanted to do when we were making the game was put our own kind of modern spin on the, the genre. I think I'm most proud of us being able to look at this game and know that we're hitting our own quality bar, especially for our first game. camera work you can tell it's super fancy this is all baby clutter you can see can you tell that we're having a baby we're having a baby this is where we work um, obviously this year lots of people work from home but we've been doing it since before it was cool and uh, yeah let's go let's go to my office here Airborne Kingdom is already on the monitor. And you can tell I'm actually working. Right, I've gotten into racing. That's like a little racing wheel. I play a little ukulele. It feels like the worst MTV crib right? This is where the magic happens. Check it out. The four of us who started the studio, we all used to work together in, in AAA. Uh, I left to go start making indie games. So we took that opportunity to kind of use our old friend group and our old expertise to start up The Wandering Band. And it was the first time that all of us felt complete creative control over something that was really big. That was fun, it was a challenge, it was also scary at the beginning. On a AAA team, you have technical artists and a dozen animators and a whole bunch of people doing back-end engine work and a lot of marketing, you know, coming up with the right way to pitch something and a lot of concepting time and all that stuff. And so I think the biggest challenge for us was trying to learn new skills and new parts of the game development process without ever doing it before. You think you know everything and then at some point you go, oh wait, we didn't know how to do that part. Well, I guess we got to figure it out. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade it away. I think it's uh, the creativity and the creative freedom is totally worth it. Airborne Kingdom is the sky city builder. So you're building your own unique sky city among the clouds and you get to fly it across a really diverse and open and randomized landscape. What I think is really cool about it is that we've kind of combined genres here a bit. It's a little bit subtle until you get to play it, but it's a city builder meets like an open RPG type of game because you can really move your kingdom to wherever you want to on this landscape and you interact with other kingdoms and they give you quests and you find hidden items throughout the world. And so what starts off feeling like a little bit of a city builder kind of morphs into this cool blending of genres. And I really think that's something different that I haven't seen before. And we've gotten a lot of positive response on it too. It's really cool. This is more of like kind of a chill experience. There's there's a lot of management and a lot of busy work in there um, that throughout the game kind of puts you in this cool flow state along with the music, along with the art. And um, we're hoping that that lets people kind of appreciate the world and the story more. People just vibe with it, you know? So we're all remote and we're actually all in different time zones now. So. Fred, our programmer, kind of jumped back and forth from Montreal to Peru. That was his consistent movement. I did a lot of my work out of Denver, Zach's out of Seattle. Um, Animish actually came to visit California and then kind of got stuck there for the pandemic. And he now lives permanently back in India. What's important to all of us is experiencing different cultures and having 
different perspectives from different places is really cool. And I think our game kind of touches on that, right? Our game is all about the fact that different cultures and building on cultures together can make something bigger than each individual piece combined. It, it kind of, you know, multiplies itself if you just kind of can learn to work together and connect with different cultures. From the art side, we took a lot of influence from like tiny little music boxes and paper craft and things like that. So it's, it's about pulling influences from many different places to hopefully create something that people haven't really seen in games before. I think we created a world that you can really get lost in and you can you can lose a lot of time just kind of exploring it and, and being mellow and, and relaxing with it. Um, and at the same time, I think there are a lot of really cool themes kind of hidden underneath if you really dig into the story um, and into the world that we've created. So I hope people just can, you know, relax into the game itself and, and move through it at their own pace while exploring the different themes we kind of cooked in there. We're really trying to give something to the gamer, as in we try to make a game how we want a game to be. Day one was just me fiddling around with some engines, and after a year or so, it was over my head, and I had too many ideas, and I started looking around for friends. So uh, that's when I found Marcel. He worked at the local supermarket, same with me. He wasn't in my regular front group. But both of us were very into the, the retro games. These were our favorites. And I remember just talking about those games around the job on occasion, and that's how it all started. We didn't really envision it this big from the beginning, but we started to raise our own bar and eventually started putting in money and a lot of our time into the development. Through the time, we ended up with different monster designers, different skill designers, different map designers, uh, UI designers, and it, it was us, Marcel and me, keeping the, the vision in line and yeah, guiding all of the employees to uh, create a consistent art style. We try to combine a lot of different elements from different games and give it a unique touch. And through time, we really saw the need to differentiate and also come with new ideas, new concepts, new mechanics and a completely different storyline. We try to look at every decision ever made and just rethink, do we want to uh, do something similar? Do we want to do it completely different? Or am I set in a futuristic world? And it's really going to take you through a lot of emotions you're gonna meet a lot of characters, a lot of interesting Pokemon designs. We introduced a lot of new mechanics, bigger bosses, which have multiple phases, have extreme, extreme power, which really require a new kind of strategy compared to other monster Tennis games. Our Pokemon have a mechanic called Potential, which makes them appear in three different collectible colorizations. It's a whole new experience in the monster taming genre, I think. And a shout out to our community. They helped us translate the demo. They helped us get out the word. The demo has been played over a million times. I think that's because of the mindset we're making this game in. We try to think, how would a gamer go for this and what would he like? I think that's the reason why we resonate with the community that much. It's just great to get a community like that. They help us make Corman what it is.
I had lived in Kyoto for a while where I'd gone to a cat cafe and it was such a surreal experience for me at the time when I was handed a business card, a cat's business card for a cat called Nico. So I, we were making management games, right? That's what our experience was. So I thought like, this seems like such a cool idea for a management game. So we sat down and we prototyped Cat Cafe Manager. It's a foggy Thursday here in the Netherlands. And it is a normal work day for us here at Roost Games. And for me, that usually starts with making my morning coffee. Roost Games is a four person Dutch, like little indie studio that we formed a little over uh, a year ago. All of us live in the same town here in the Netherlands. It's a town called Utrecht, a medieval little town. It's really beautiful. I could literally get on my bike and bike to any of them. We have board game nights together. That's why I have this big pile of board games behind me. And we play video games together and we just hang out a lot as well. Uh, not these days, but we used to. <laughs> just get a little work done in the morning, then go out into town on my bike, meet two of my coworkers for lunch. I'm really looking forward to that because it's been a while. It's been a strange year. Uh, like starting a studio in 2020 was a weird experience because me and Rutger got to working together like in person for only a little bit before we had to go into lockdown. And from that point on, it was a lot of figuring out like, uh, how do we do this? A thing that we found after a couple of months working is that we would just not be talking about Cat Cafe Manager. Like we'd be talking about the work we were doing, but not about like the game itself and how it made us feel, our hopes and wishes for the game, where we saw it moving. So we started doing this thing like at least once every month where we just talk about the game, game talk. And that's been super valuable to us. <sighs> All right, so I'm now biking to go hang out with Rutger and Carmen for a little bit. Eat a sandwich, maybe talk about the game. Maybe not, we'll see. Well, if it isn't Rutger. Goedemorgen. Hello. I don't know, there's like a, a thing about the team that is very important to us, which is that we are effectively a co-op. Previously, like working for studios, we, we always felt that you know, there is a lot of camaraderie that comes through making games. And we we would really like to see that be reflected in the way that we treat everybody that works at Roost Games. We make sure that everybody essentially receives an equal financial cut of whatever we do. And we feel like that sort of allows people to bring themselves into the process and into the, into the game so much more and like really add their own sort of passion. So that's been like super freeing for me and I think for everybody else at, at Roost Games. I'm actually quite happy with how we've been able to put everything that we find important pretty centrally in the game. When you're petting a cat, I don't know what it is, like endorphins that are being released, like the, the good feeling that you get from that, that we kind of wanted to put in the game. There's something inherently relaxing about taking care of this adorable animal that is both at your whims and incredibly like defined of, of you. Every cat that we have in the game is like a, a unique cat with their own personality. So we're always looking for, you know, people that have cats. Like if I'm visiting someone that has a cat, I'm like, okay, what, what kind of a cat is this? Actually, I don't think any of our team members have cats. So maybe that is the reason that we're making a cat cafe manager game. It's very much a game about building your own little space and then filling it with the kind of like the kind of furniture that you like and the people that you like as well and the cats most importantly that you that you like we live in a time that's like pretty stressful and out of control in a lot of ways so for us it's very important that you sort of get a cozy feeling when you get introduced to the game you will always want a little bit of challenge and tension but we're looking for like a, a good equilibrium between chill and challenging finding the the right kinds of furniture that you like and adopting uh, stray cats, caring for them, naming them, and sort of figuring out what their personality is. You can sort of always keep making progress, uh, designing your cafe and adopting more cats um, and making friends also. 
just making the cat cafe of your dreams. really rural town. So is Tanner, the other lead developer on the game. We both grew up together in the same 500 population Arkansas town. <laughs> the two of us, the two lead devs, we live together. We're partners. So we've been together for since middle school, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I am definitely one of those people who played games all growing up and both of us were really passionate about it. He was one of the first people I ever met that actually wanted to have these interesting conversations about the design of games and stuff like that. We went to college here also in Arkansas and you know we tried out some projects and actually um, To the Rescue started as our one of our sort of undergrad like hey let's see if we can actually make a game just as a hobby thing let's try it out. That's sort of how the project started. To the Rescue is where you play as somebody working in a dog shelter and taking on all the responsibilities that entails. But also getting to know all of the unique dogs so that you can take care of them and find the right homes for them. Having that moment of the dog that it's not very cute, it's old, and you've been trying to get it adopted forever, but then that one person comes and it's the right person and takes them away. Like that moment, I want to be the most memorable thing for people when they play the game. We thought it was a cool idea because we hadn't seen one before, you know, a game like this. And, and yeah, we just felt like it was a lot of potential and we were really surprised no one else was doing it. And we just felt like if we were going to pick a project, this is one that felt really marketable and might help us get on our feet and stand out a little bit, especially not having the big community to sort of help uplift us. There's no companies, right? No, there's no video game companies in Little Rock or the state of Arkansas. So we decided to just jump off the deep end and be like, hey, let's try and just be the first. Little Rock Games is just five people. In this project it, within Little Rock Games, it's just Tanner and I delegating tasks to each other and also giving feedback to each other and also being in a relationship with each other. And, and yeah, so having really that that and sort of inherent support structure has been really important from my perspective. Oh, my special guest star appeared in the background. <laughs> People love dogs so much, but this is also about raising awareness, right? It's, it's both of those things. We heard a lot of positive feedback just, just to the core concept, right? Yeah, it is sort of escapism getting to do this without having to face the realities yourself, but we're also not pretending those realities aren't there. Is in the game, you know, there's diseases that can appear in the shelter. It's dirty and adopters only want the cutest puppies and they don't want the old dogs. And, uh, and, and we do feature euthanasia as an element in the game. It's completely optional, but it's there. So essentially, I just want people to walk away with more knowledge about the things we're representing. And I, and I feel like there's a lot of room in sim management games to explore the real world in more nuanced ways. So it is important for us to find that balance of wanting people to be able to experience this dog management, but also not being able to completely ignore the fact that real people have to do these jobs. It's resonated with a lot more people than we expected it to, and we've gotten a lot of people that work in real shelters that are like, I'm glad that you're doing this because a lot of people don't realize how hard the work is and how thankless it is. So 20% of every dollar that Little Rock Games makes from this game is going to be going to the Pet Finder Foundation. The game is about being hopeful that you can improve your community in some small way. <laughs> first started getting into games probably about seven or eight years old i was always kind of like tinkering around with game engines they never really went anywhere until about maybe 15 or 16 where i started putting games on the web so like flash games and, and things like that i then studied a degree in game development and then 
I've just been kind of putting out little mobile games here and there, just really simple tap based games. But it wasn't challenging. I mean, it came a point where I, I wanted to stretch myself a little bit with the games I was creating. I always liked the idea of really silly deaths, characters getting blown to bits in like a cartoony way. The thing with most games is when you die, it's usually an area of frustration. But when you can see your, your character's head just flying off and blood's going everywhere, it's like, <laughs> you just got nothing but humor there. They're sure gonna feel bad in the morning. So I come up with the idea of having like a Ninja Warrior slash Total Wipeout death competition. And that was Slaughter League. So the last Flash game I made was in like 2014. And there's still people speed running it to this day. So I got chatting to those guys um, about sort of what features they think are really important for speed running. And I thought, well, if you guys are still enjoying, you know, what I made six, seven, eight years ago, then I might as well tailor as, as many features as I can towards these guys too. One of the pillars of Slaughter League in itself is that it's, it's built with the same design philosophies as I'd take into a Flash game. We want to be what we know and be the best at that. For me, the, the thing with Slaughter League where, where it kind of breaks expectation is the amount of content that's going to be there. From your sort of standard small little platform indie game, you might get a single player mode or you might get multiplayer racing or you might sometimes get a stage builder it's, it, that's even more rare, but you'll never get all three in one. We're kind of offering the level of content as a AAA developer, but with an indie game. We've been working a lot on the stage builder side of things. And what that's going to let players do is not just build stages, but build game modes. It will basically make other games within Slaughter League. Players can kind of build their own collectibles and build their own puzzle maps or build their own races, zombie maps, whatever it might be. We want to give them as many tools as possible to achieve as many different creations as possible, essentially. So that's something I'm hugely excited about. It is a developer to think there might be, you know, some of the younger audience don't quite understand programming, they don't quite understand 3D model, but they can build a level and be proud of that and send that to the friends, share that with the world. We're, we're kind of hoping the creatives have an outlet. The thing is we're making games is there's so many moving parts to it. You've got, you know, like I say, the 3D art, you've got the, the menus, the things that you don't really consider. This was my first 3D game. The mobile games before this were all 2D based and that, that was a skill set I never had. Some of the code I built early on was the kind of stuff you'd have for a blog. Josh, the backend guy, he was, he just laughed. He was like, this, as soon as you launch this, we'll just fall apart. I was like, oh no. <laughs> it worked fine for like 10 of us, you know, there's like 10 of us playing. It's, it was enough to sustain that. But if we was to get a big launch with this old code, it would just set on fire. I started it with just a, one laptop. <laughs> it's pretty one much it. You built the whole thing on a laptop? Yeah, well, it's, it's to be fair, the good thing is about building it on a laptop is if I can get it to run really, really well on this, I know for a fact it's going to run really well on you know people's absolute beasts. I was actually working two jobs at the same time as developing the game. Retail during the start of the pandemic, which was pretty wild, and also teaching at the local university too for game development. I'd feel guilty not working on the game. I'd have all these fantastic ideas while I was there. You know, I'd be on the checkout just thinking about Slaughter League and by the time I get home, I'd just be like, ah, do I have to? Then speaking to Freedom, we ended up deciding that it would be best if I worked full time on the game. The first month or so, at least, I was having dreams about having to go back to work. I was having dreams that, ah, oh, I've got a shift soon, what, what am I doing? And I wake up, I was like, no, you aren't going to be back for, you know, <laughs> at all, it's great having the freedom to just be able to focus all of my mind onto the game it's just going to make it so much better as a product than it would have been because it's got love put into it now it's got time and it's undivided attention i think is like the main thing this game it sounds corny but it's changed my life in that way whereas no other game had before i, I was still working the two jobs while building the mobile games while building the flash games or whatever it might have been whereas this game has just flipped my life to where I want it to be. To finally be able to do this as a job is just insane. I love it. This is definitely like a good, just relax, chill in the evening, play with buds, laugh at stupid stuff kind of game.
Oh, this is sick. <laughs> Dark Deity is what happens when you take uh, the character customization levels of an RPG and put it into a high strategy chess-like gameplay style. Each character has access to nine different classes with branching weapon trees, with huge customization within the equipment. The entire focus is laid on you get to choose what your characters are good at and what they're bad at. It is very much a combination of genres. I was pretty laid back in college. I did just fine, but uh, I worked on Dark Deity. I didn't work on my own work. <laughs> None of us have ever worked on <laughs> games at all. There's one member of the dev team that's worked on like a couple student projects, but really this is our first real game that we're working on. For the majority of development, we worked on it in the dorm. And we would sort of just sit in the dorm room, just like, you know, type of working away. I learned how to code. I sat in my room and for 16 hours a day for like a whole week, I just didn't leave my room, didn't eat, didn't <laughs> do anything. We're very tight knit. That's what's so fun about making Dark Deity is that it, we are friends. The team is five friends. So like when we're on work calls, we're hanging out. It's not like, oh man, I have a meeting at eight. And we, sometimes we meet till like midnight, you know how it is. We all have very, very different sensibilities and opinions on the team. Um, we, we like to be open about disagreeing and trying to find like the best solution that everyone can agree on. And we sort of argue, <laughs> healthily argue most of the time. There's a certain level of, of maturity that it takes to be able to, you know, talk to a friend and say, hey, I disagree with this. And it's, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with, you know, the impact on the game or, you know, the quality of the thing. And the fact that we have a full team that can really respect that is huge. An attitude that we've had that I think we all feel happy that we've stuck with uh, is that we've been sort of uncompromising on trying to make everyone happy. Um, it's been a, it's been really hard to stick to our guns and say, you know, take a mechanic that we think makes the game better, but not everyone's going to like it really committing to doing that and making the best game we can and knowing that uh, there's going to be some people that might like it less for that, even if it you know results in a, a better game. You can't please everybody. And in knowing that we're not going to please everybody, we're not compromising on any mechanics and watering them down. It's an art form that the industry is sort of losing, that, that way of artfully telling you no, you have to do this another time or you can't do this. And it, it's 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 a bit of a push and pull. Finding that sweet spot in the progression where it's accessible, but we're not letting you just do anything you want with no you know consequences or no real meat to your actions. You should have to choose a path at some point. You can play this thing so many times and have the gameplay feel different. You know, there's going to be a lot of character bonds you don't see in two, three, four playthroughs, maybe, and depending on if you're trying to see them all. Having it built to not only be replayed, but for you to really find out more about the world and, and figure out more about the gameplay as you play more is pretty exciting. To talk about just how much the scoping has changed, it's almost indescribable. We would have been happy with a thousand people seeing it when we first started. Like that would have been the biggest success ever. This is our first game. We want to keep making games. And if, if the quality of this is, you know, our very first effort and we've learned a lot through it and, you know, the, the next one's obviously going to come with a much higher level of expertise. This is, it's grassroots. I, I think we're all, I mean, we're all excited. Uh, it's terrifying, but it's really exciting because, you know, where, where we're at, we're all 23. Two of us haven't even graduated college yet. I mean, to, to ship a game of this quality is pretty exciting.
Maybe I should raise my rates. I failed my people. Consequences. This would make for a fine take. I always thought that I would be good at making video games. My mom just sent me a picture of a drawing I did when I was like eight, titled My Own Game. A, basically a Mario level that I, I had drawn up myself. I'd grown up with games, I always loved them. I really wanted to make my own studio. And I realized that's like not really super realistic. It was kind of like wanting to be, you know, a football star. I was diagnosed with Asperger's autism as a child, and I basically kind of just told myself, no, nah, there's no way I could be in management. You know, it's a, a social disorder where you have difficulty analyzing social situations. So I kind of just assumed that because of that quote unquote disadvantage that I had, I couldn't do it, that I couldn't compete with other people in part because of a label. And the, I mean, the label was helpful. It helped me recognize the, the problem and how to overcome it. But I needed to understand that it wasn't the end all be all. Through therapy as a child and then continuing through college, my own efforts on my own to finish my own development and learning, I overcame it. Many things you can overcome uh, with enough effort. It'll take a lot of time and a lot of effort. It took me 28 years. That was when I decided, you know what, I've dabbled in indie games. I'm gonna give this one last shot before I'm 40. I was like, it has to get done. That's the most important thing. What's most satisfying and makes me happiest is that now I'm doing my dream doing something I thought I couldn't do. We just want to make a fun game and we want people to look at it and think that that looks fun. And all through this process, uh, I had two kids. I'm proud to say that my oldest son, who is now four, finally beat the first two levels of the original Kirby. Yes. <laughs> The other cool thing about this is I've been able to actually involve my wife. My wife has actually written three novels. And so I was like, you know what? Why don't you write for our game? We have a worldwide team. We have people in like 10 countries, I think. US, Canada, Brazil, Portugal, England, Scotland, Germany, Italy, Russia, and Singapore. What brings me a lot more satisfaction, and maybe this is because I've had kids, is seeing everything just come together into this sum that is greater than something I could have possibly made by myself. Finding all the right talented people to bring their ideas and their creativity and vision into the project, which is not something I, I necessarily even thought of going into it. Through this process, I've really learned how valuable people are. There's 20 people on the team. I'm just one of them. The 3D artists, the 2D artists, the programmers, all of them have been invaluable. Uh, it would not be here today if it wasn't for that. And I'm hoping to convey some of that through the game's narrative. You have to have growth and you have to have progress. So for us, loneliness drives you to push forward in the game. And it also helps highlight the value of connection, friendships and interpersonal dynamics. And it's something that I, I thought became fairly prescient with the onset of uh, the COVID lockdowns. People kind of underestimated the idea of loneliness when they were actually faced with it, when they were actually isolated from each other. A lot of people seem to realize, oh wait, 
we can't just pull up in our houses and feel fulfilled. If I was to say there was any kind of a goal with One Lonely Outpost that I'm hoping for people to get out of it that's greater than just a fun game, it's maybe being able to reflect a little bit on what community means to them. When I feel bad and when I have bad uh, times, I, I always go to games to disconnect and relax. I was really glad for having games that made me feel that way. And I want to be able to give at least one person the same opportunity I had with, with our game. How the game started is actually through university. We did uh, the project as kind of like uh, our last year project. We started at six people and just we really like each other. We really work well together and we had fun. That always created a, a good dynamic for us to work together. and. So yeah, it was just friends doing a game together. Basically, the, the, the main concept is you run a cloud taker. You need to treat them, you need to be with them, um, make them feel better and go out into the world. You need to explore, you need to gather different items, you need to cook meals. It feels good to let yourself get lost a little bit in, in that world. So there's definitely a, a, an exploration factor that it's also important. We knew we wanted to create a game that was uh, fun, but also relaxing. Again, had kind of like a safe space, having something uh, that is positive and that uh, gives you reassurance. And so from those two ideas, we started to look to games that we liked and we started to create something similar to those games. It's relaxing and it, it gives people a, a place to disconnect. 
character customization is something that is really important uh, to me because you can create a character however you want it. The game makes a hard work of never asking you for your gender identity or, or limiting you in any way in that sense. And so that's something that it's important to me and that I was proud of, you know, uh, making making work because if you want to create a, a safe space and you want everyone to feel good, you need to be able to create a character that, uh, that doesn't put that pressure of, of gender on you, you know? We want to make you feel better with this game. We want you to feel good. I'm an indie game developer from Indonesia and the game industry in Indonesia is still relatively new and at the time when I started there was only a web forum and the thing about Indonesia is that a game dev is not a main career people usually want to be a doctor or architect it's, it's something that's absurd for our previous generation I spent a lot of time in that forum and eventually found some friends talk a lot about video games and then just interact with each other and then just uh, one day we decided to make a simple shooter game and then we just keep making games Unchart is an action RPG about restoring fallen civilization you play as a bell wielding character that goes into dungeon to retrieve souls of missing villagers and also rebuilding the town throughout the game we basically love retro games, especially 16-bit and 32-bit era. I think that was the era when we still had the excitement of a child, but also old enough to appreciate the game design. So we, we want to recreate that kind of experience to modern players. So it's like a retro experience, but with modern feel. We put a lot of care into designing different enemy patterns, different obstacles, and also different kind of puzzles that you will encounter. Every level has a unique gimmick. And you can also knock enemies to jars, destructible objects. The thing that I'm really happy about Unchart is the combat design and also the enemy design. Just seeing the characters move and interact with each other is really rewarding to me. I think it's mostly about the old school game that we miss the style. So. We put a lot of care in the development. I was, you know, working with my family, my family business, uh, doing business management. And I got to the point where, you know what, I, I can't, I can't do this office work because this isn't what I want to do with my life or it just didn't feel, you know, fulfilling enough. Uh, so I took a step back from that, went back to school and, and decided to, you know, pursue game development and give that a shot and give that a try. Actually, that's how my team was formed too. We all went to the same school and we all worked together on the student project. It was fun to make and it was a great learning experience, but it wasn't really a game that we wanted to make. So we moved on and really sat down and really focused in on the game we wanted to create, which we got to where we are today with Sands of Aura. Sands of Aura is an open world action RPG and it's set in this decaying world we call Talon Hell. And Talon Hell is riddled with, you know, sand and dust due to an ancient spell that turned everything into an entropic ruin. While the players are playing this game, they are given full control to fully customize 
the way they want to play with a variety of fighting styles and and literally thousands of weapon combinations to tackle on different enemies and bosses to encounter throughout the world. The thing I'm most proud of that our team created was this weapon creation system. We don't care if the item that you end up creating is completely broken and it breaks like every single boss fight we have. Like we want the players to be able to find that and and have fun with that. And and I think that's something that you know it's kind of missing in a lot of different types of games. You want to be able to create these, you know, really janky or broken builds, or even just try something completely different that you're you haven't really seen in, in games, or even just blow our mind as developers away. Like we have never thought that somebody can do this with our creation system. I think everybody that's played video games want and feel like they can design a game. Like they play a game like I can do this, right? But then once you actually jump into it and you learn all about the the intricate parts of the, the programming, the art, the animation, the cinematics, the UI, user experience, all these different elements to make a game, like you don't think about it, you know, when you're just playing it. But when you're making it, you have to like, understand how all these pieces work to create something like amazing that players enjoy. And that was the, the challenge. Oh, what the... The best thing about my team is that we push each other really hard. Like every time somebody comes out with a new art concept or a new animation for something, we're actively critiquing it and just pushing each other to do better and better. You know, we, we want to do the best that we can so that we as a group can do really well and continue living this dream of just making video games. Nine Years of Shadows and Metroidvania. So it's this action adventure exploration game. You get to explore a big setting and you get power ups that allow you to move and fight in different and interesting ways. Although it's all sort of an excuse to tell this very important story that comes out of depression and overcoming it. I've always been into creative arts and narrative. When I was in film school, I, I, I was actually creating this script as a homework assignment. And it was a very sad story. I, I, wasn't re I didn't realize I was writing about myself at the time. It's about depression and very emotional, deep stuff. We created this company, which is called Hal Halbert Studios, uh, that creates animation and films, advertisement, things like that. And when we had a bit of money saved, we said like, okay, advertisement is okay, but we actually want to do like creative stuff, right? So what should we do? And I had that story from 2013. And so I said, you know what? Like, let's, let's do something with this. I'm also a very big video game fan and we had animators and we had artists and we knew a bit about that pipeline. And so it wasn't a plan, but we managed to transform our everyday job into let's make something that we are proud of and that is ours. You know, music plays a big role. Back in the day, when I was really, really down, feeling down, like I remember Castlevania being one of the soundtracks that uplift me the most. Like it, it, it made me feel a lot better listening to that soundtrack. And it was funny because when I met the composer, Michiru Yamane, uh, I told her that story and she's actually composing part of the soundtrack because of it. 
the composer from Metal Gear is also doing a track and uh, Manami Matsumai, uh, uh, the composer from Mega Man is also doing a track. So, so music is very important for me and for the game. We try to include it as much as possible in the gameplay and the mechanics. And so that's, I think, one of the highlights. We have this musical thing with the bosses. So boss fights are musical. And we try to implement that as deep as possible. So you can almost hear what the boss is doing, their rhythms, their attacks and stuff like that. The music will be something to look out for. There's also this analogy with light. So as a DP, I used to excel a bit more in terms of the visual part of it. Visual language became such an interesting thing for me. There's some element of respect to that. You know, light is such an interesting character to the story. The essential element in a Metroidvania is to explore. You need to make exploring interesting. You know, making these elemental armors for the main character was such a big part of it. You get to move and fight in different ways. Fire, earth, and water are uh, three different ways of moving towards the castle. And in a Metroidvania, it makes a lot of sense because you tend to visit the same place more than once. And so if that place, now you can move differently through those rooms and then it becomes you know, more interesting. And so that strategy of changing your, your suit on the fly is just something that I think it's fun. You can expect weird stuff to happen in the game. It's just not your traditional Metroidvania. A game that's about mental health problems. That is a very important message. That's why this project exists, for this message. A cinematographer wrote a script and then it became a company and the company ended up doing video games. So it's just a mess of a story, but that's, I think that's, that's life. <laughs>
took us a long time to get here. We put a lot of hard work into it. Shipping games brings tough times, but we've also seen like success together. Success for us is defined as being able to continue to do this because we really love it. We want to be what we know and be the best at that. Making something that people enjoy. You dreaming but love yeah. Click that eye to partner with Freedom and join the Freedom family so we can all grow together. You get many perks like position music, you also get epidemic sound, a lot of other access to royalty free videos, sponsorships, and many things to help you grow. Just click the links down there in the description below to get involved in our community, our forums, our discord chat servers, meet our graphics team, meet our community team, all of that on discord and the forums. What are you waiting for? Get started. And we will grow together as a family because this is the Freedom Family. You are part of it, we are all part of it, and we're all growing together. To get more George, click that big F. That will subscribe you to Freedom Central, home of The George Show. And PewDiePie gave one of you, Freedom Family, a big shout out. Click that video to see the shout out and to see our new 3D sets for you and click that video to see what YouTube recommends you watch next.